All right, thanks everyone for being here. I'm John Blischak. Um, I'm excited to be here to tell you about my uh, R package for reproducible research. Uh, so first, a little bit about me. So I'm an Akron native. Um, I was down in uh, Athens where I studied biology. Then I went off to the University of Chicago where I did my PhD in genetics. Um, and then recently, just earlier this year, uh, my family and I moved back to Ohio, so now we're living in Copley. Uh, but though I'm in Ohio now, uh, I work remotely still for the University of Chicago where I'm a postdoctoral scholar with Professor Matthew Stevens in the departments of statistics and human genetics. Um, my role there sort of has two main parts. One is I build bioinformatics pipelines for single cell RNA sequencing data. Um, that's not what this talk will be about. Uh, so it'll be the other half where I develop software uh, to support reprodu reproducible research. And that's why I developed uh, my R, R package workflow R. Um, just to give you the high level R overview, it's a way to make it so that any R programmer can have an organized, reproducible, and shareable project. Um, and over the last year, scientists from multiple different universities have used workflow R to create version control web types, websites to share their, uh, their research online in a, a well-documented fashion. So I've split my talk into three parts. So the first, I'll talk about the importance of reproducibility. Uh, and this will sort of bend towards scientific research because that's my normal audience, but anyone who has to rerun uh, your own code or someone else's code, uh, these are all uh, important. Um, then I'll talk about how I, from, sort of from scratch, using various different tools, put together a reproducible workflow for one of my PhD projects. And I'll end showing how the workflow R package automates a lot of that and makes it sort of a painless experience uh, to, imp to implement the reproducible workflow that I had, uh, I had done in the previously. So reproducibility is a problem for science. You may have seen some uh, articles. Uh, it's made it into the popular press. Um, but one problem is there's, there's a lack of training. So more and more scientists are writing code, but don't really get any formal or even informal training and best practices for writing that code. Uh, and it's also a cultural issue. Um, there's a lot of problems with just sharing the data in the code in the first place, uh, whether or not it's even reproducible code. So this recent study uh, of 200 randomly selected studies um, fewer than half could they even get the data to, if you even wanted to try and build on the results. Um, and over, only, overall, only a quarter of them were actually reproducible. So it's not a great state. And focusing more on, on my field in biology, uh, the picture is very similar. Uh, so these were um, gene expression microarray studies, 18 of them, uh, where they tried to just get the data and then reproduce the main results. And it was a similar picture where fewer than half could they even get uh, well, a few things half they could reproduce, and the biggest reason for that was a lack of data. Can't even get started. Um, but, and these are big picture ethical issues with the whole field uh, of science uh, that no one person can change. Uh, but I quickly learned during my PhD that reproducibility, first and foremost, was a problem for me because most other people aren't trying to run my code. It's always future me that's stuck trying to rerun my code. So. Um, apart from the, the bigger uh, ethical reasons uh, about scientific research, it really helps you, uh, if no one else. So uh, I was sort of motivated to try and make my research as reproducible as possible, so that future me would make it have it easier when I had to say collect new data and rerun my analyses or address reviewer comments. That this was a, a more seamless process um, than something I would dread. And this is not a novel concept. This is, this is a quote from 1995. It's been talking about this for decades. Uh, we're still not quite there. Um, this is a famous quote about how uh, a scientific publication is just advertising, and that the real scientific product is the code and data uh, that are underlying those results, and that's what should be built upon. Uh, but something that has changed in the last, uh, uh, last few decades is that there's a lot, of, a lot more tools available uh, to the average scientist or average R programmer to be able to work more reproducibly. And lucky for us as R programmers, a lot of the, uh, the sort of R ecosystem it really facilitates this. Um, this is nicely um, exemplified in this uh, review by Lounge and colleagues where they document how they tried to implement a more reproducible workflow as their team of scientists. Um, and not surprisingly, R was a big part of that in associated packages like R Markdown. Uh, and they combine that with things like Git and GitHub to be able to, um, among a small team of scientists, make their work reproducible. And so I'll talk about all these technologies because they're the same ones that I chose um, for my workflow. 
So in summary, working reproducibility, it's, it's critical for establishing trust in your results. It's most importantly going to save you time in the long run. And it's the first required step if you or someone else is going to try to extend your work, which if you put a lot of uh, initial effort into, you want to make that as easy as possible for someone else to take it uh, and build upon it. OK, so now my personal experience. So around the middle of my PhD, I started a new project. So my earlier ones were all solo projects where I could choose what I wanted to do, choose which technologies, and have whatever convoluted setup I wanted. But for this one, I was going to have multiple contributors, so I had to document the process better, onboard people who with varying levels of different programming languages. Also, we have multiple different collaborators that not, you know, not directly coding, but who would want to see the results, and I wanted a better way to share the thin results than sending emails or trying to sync up in Dropbox and that sort of, that sort of mess. And also, the time was a newer uh, type of data. Um, this is back in 2015, it was single cell RNA sequencing. So I knew a lot of what we we're gonna be doing was exploring and iterating on the data. So with multiple different people um, constantly um, changing the code, I needed a way to keep this all organized and reproducible. So what were the ideal features I was going for? So one, I wanted an organized directory structure so we knew where to save files and where to find them. I wanted to be able to connect the coders' results so I didn't have just one of my colleagues just giving me a figure and I have no idea what decisions and cutoffs they used to make that figure. I wanted to know when I saw a result what, how it was created, the, the computational setup, because we'd all be using our own local systems or uh, our, our compute cluster. So if something wasn't working uh, or it gave a strange result, knowing what uh, versions of packages created them was critical. Since we'd all be changing files uh, asynchronously, asynchronously, I wanted to be able to have a way to find and uh, rerun any outdated uh, analyses. I want to track development of not only the code, but the results, um, to make that uh, close connection between a version of the code and a result that we have. I wanted to be able to facilitate collaboration, so we'd have to worry about emailing each other files or overwriting our files in Dropbox or something like that. And like I said, I want to be able to easily distribute the results to our multiple collaborators, but then also the wider scientific community. So at the time, I explored various different options for computational research notebooks. Um, and I was really big into R Markdown at the time. And so the best example I found that was inspiring was the documentation website for R Markdown, um, which itself is created from R Markdown files. I thought, well, this is great. If I could have my research all displayed in a nice website like this, uh, that would be ideal. Okay, so I took that uh, R Markdown documentation website as a, as a template, so I wanted to add some organized directory structure because I knew with multiple different people, if we were just saving files randomly in one big directory, it was gonna quickly get unmanageable. And that prefer preferably you'd have a sort of a hierarchical uh, organized directory structure. So I implemented a, a simple scheme where code held long running scripts that we'd have to submit to our HPC cluster. Data was where the raw data files were and the analysis had the exploratory data analysis files. Which in our case was R Markdown, uh, which as many of you probably know, is a great system for literate programming, connect code results and the output. Um, for those unfamiliar, it's critical to know and understand the rest of the talk, but there's three components of an R Markdown file. There's the YAML header where you specify metadata, for example, the title, author, date, and the output format. There's Markdown, this is a Markup language is easier to write than H read and write than HTML, and the most importantly, the code chunks, where you put the code to be executed. So how R Markdown works, as a user, you're just gonna run the render function from the R Markdown package and give it the name of your R Markdown file. But under the hood, is actually doing a multi-step process. First, it's processing it through the knitter package to run all the code and insert the, the output of that code. Then this Markdown file gets passed through the generic uh, file processor Pandoc, which can convert it to HTML or other formats. And so a lesser known feature, as I've mentioned, is websites. R Markdown has, it makes it uh, fairly easy to go from a collection of, of, of R Markdown files to a connected website um, by including one extra file, uh, underscore site.yaml file. So for example, this one, you specify a navigation bar. So for example, home is mapped to the index.html page and about and the navigation bar is mapped to about.html. Then you can also specify the, the formatting options to be consistently applied to every single one of your files. And that's what it looked like. So here's a screencast of just how this would kind of look like in practice. 
So by putting hyperlinks either in the, in the navigation bar or directly in there, you can move around in your, in your project. So this is freeing for your readers, right? They don't have to have a, one big long file to try and find what they want um, and, or open up multiple different files to find what it is. Any reader can find um, the part of it that interests them uh, and ignore the rest. Okay, so to record the, the, the version information, uh, we started from an R markdown template file that at the end of every analysis would run session info, the R function. So this will tell us the R version, the operating system, and any attached R packages in their versions. Okay, so to find and rerun code that was uh, outdated, what I did was I, I adapted the make file that our studio team had used to create their website. So the relevant snip uh, uh, of make there's these two lines, and what this does is for each R markdown file, it compares it to its companion HTML, looks at the modification times. If the R markdown has been modified more recently, it's gonna rerun, render, and rebuild the HTML file. So the main takeaways from this is make is really powerful, but also trying to read this is a little tough, especially for beginners. Um, and to have to learn this um, is not easy. Um, some other benefits of this setup, as you can see, we use set.seed, so for random number generation, the same seed is being set before every analysis. Um, and then each one is a new call to R. So all these, file, all these uh, analyses are reproducible because they can't conflict with each other. Um, each time it's getting spun up a new R process to build this file. Okay, so track development of code, we used Git, uh, which uh, doesn't have the best reputation. It can be a little bit arcane because it's has lots and lots of uh, features for big teams of software developers. Um, but my small team uh, of collaborators, by just using the main uh, functions, we were able to get the majority of the benefit out of it that we needed. Um, and it gave us a lot more fine growing control. Like I said, if Dropbox, if two people edit it, it's just gonna create two files. Um, it doesn't fail very gracefully. And what's critical about this for a science project then is you have the, the context of every time you or someone else made a decision, right? So Git requires a commit message when each time you update the code. So here I can put a bunch of different links in it because uh, especially for me, like three months later, I can never remember why I made a change. Um, and without that commit history of telling me why in the context of what I had done, it was always just sort of a mystery. Okay, so the, so the advice to version control your source code is really popular and, and really widespread. But when you're doing exploratory data analysis where you're constantly collecting new data, constantly trying new parameters, uh, create, generating new results, I think it's really important to track the development of the results as well. So our R Markdown template uh, automatically inserted the version of the code at the top of each file. So each analysis would say the last time that file was updated and the, the snapshot, the most recent git commit, would be inserted at the top. And so then if months later a, a, a code could no longer produce the same results, we know that we, we could always return to that past version to recreate those results and also compare and see what changed. So to facilitate collaborations, if you're already using Git, we were able to use GitHub. Um, you could use a similar uh, other uh, Git hosting site. Um, but there's a lot of nice tools. Each person can have their own copy, uh, their own fork, make changes, then, and then send a pull request. Um, with their changes. Okay, and so now you see the similarity with the original R Markdown documentation website, but this is what we created. So all the, the, the theme is all the same, but by because we were using Git um, uh, to version control everything, and we were using and then hosting on GitHub, and they were creating a website with R Markdown, we were able to take, care, take advantage of the service GitHub pages, which will offer free static website hosting. So with a few clicks on GitHub, now our site was live to the whole world. We didn't have to worry about running a web server or anything like that. And I mainly, my main motivation for this was to be able to share among collaborators and so I didn't have to keep sending e emails. Um, but this actually worked out really well um, because other researchers found this. So a professor was teaching a workshop on, a, on this subject on single cell RNA sequencing. So before we even had a publication, he, uh, he reached out to us, asked us if he could use our data and taught our sort of project and our results to a whole group of people in our field. Um, so you can't ask for better advertising than that before you've even gotten around to publishing. So in summary, uh, the reproducible workflow uh, I created was time consuming. It took a while to get all these things, pieces and parts working together. I had to know multiple different technologies to, to get it to work. However, it really increased the confidence in, my, in, our, in our results if a collaborator 
gave me a result. I could look and see exactly what version of the code created on what date and what code they ran. And it advertised your results um, uh, to the wider community. Okay, so now into my package. So after the success of this sort of version controlled website, I had lots of other colleagues asking me to help them set up a similar thing. Um, and it was really hard for them to, to get the setup right, and it was hard for me to teach them because there were so many different parts, um, different technology you had to install, and different template files. Um, and there's also other details I left out just because they're, they're too arcane to discuss here, but there's a lot of ways for it to fail. Um, and so what I wanted to be able to do is that anyone who knew how to program in R could get this same sort of reproducible website and just focus on their analysis, focus on the scientific questions they're trying to answer by writing their R code and have the rest taken, in the back, uh, taken care of in the background. And so that's sort of the, the genesis of the Workflow R project. So I combine the ability to make an R Markdown website, so Knitter and R Markdown, I combine that with version control with Git, and then I provide documentation for how to set up web hosting on GitHub. Um, so with just uh, an R package and knowing R, you can create, recreate the same, same thing I had. Okay, so for an organized directory structure, so the function workflow start, you give it the name of your new directory, and it'll automatically populate with all the directories and uh, template files that you need to get started. Um, and so they're similar to what I had before. Analysis has the R Markdown files, all the sources for the, for the website. The new one is docs. That's where all the website files will go. So all the HTML, figures, and then support files like JavaScript and CSS files will all get saved in docs. And those are the two required directories. The other ones are, are um, just recommended and you could delete them if you wanted to. So for example, code and output and uh, data. And you don't have to just start from scratch. Let's say you had an R package and you want to demonstrate, uh, or a current project, and you want to demonstrate some results, create a website. You could give Workflow Start the name of your project, and it will add the workflow or sort of infrastructure to your existing product project. And if you're not a Studio user, you can use directly from the IDE. You can use a, a project template. Um, and this has the added benefit that it will open up the R Studio project immediately, and so then you'll have everything. Like you'll see in the files pane in here in this screencast, uh, everything um, yeah, gets set up nicely for you. So the package gets loaded, and all the analysis and everything is there. Okay. okay, connect code with results. So this is a nice thing because it's built upon our markdown. If you already know our markdown, workflow R will be very natural to you because it's just doing the same thing. So if you have an R markdown analysis that you can create an HTML from, if you copy paste that file into the analysis directory of a workflow R project, it should just work, uh, which is really nice. Um, okay. okay, so to record the versions of the software and operating system, you don't have to remember to put session info at the end of your analysis. So the, the new output format, workflow HTML, will automatically append that, will automatically run it and append the results to end of it, at the end of your analysis. It also now it implements setting a seed. So it'll set the same seed before each one of your analyses. So if you have any sort of thing like a permutation um, or anything like that, it will be perfectly reproducible whether you run it or your colleague runs it. And because it's built on top, on top of the HTML document uh, output format, okay, that comes shipped with our Markdown website, you just have to change one line in your site.yaml file, and all your other settings are unchanged. They'll still work. They'll still add a table of contents and set the same, the same, same theme. Uh, but also does much more than just uh, ex just uh, extend uh, HTML document. So one thing it does is it adds a reproducibility report to the top of the document. So what this does is goes through, checks various things that are important for re reproducibility. And if you click on any one of these bullet points, it'll explain to you why it's important for reproducibility uh, and other things about the settings. And analogously, if you don't use the workflow R function and you fail some of these reproducibility checks, it'll give you a red X and it'll tell you why it failed and why is it important and how to fix it. Okay, so to rerun code that has been updated, so before I'd been using the make file, um, but that requires a separate installation. Uh, it hasn't requires running a whole new syntax. So instead I have now workflow build, so that will automatically check all the R markdown files in their corresponding HTML and rebuild the ones that are outdated. Now you don't have to learn make syntax. Um, 
One thing I lost, remember I said I liked the make file because it's gonna run a new, a new session of R each for each file. That's hard to do when you're inside of an R console. So I had to do some engineering uh, of workflow build to make sure that each time it ran render, it was in a totally, totally isolated uh, R process. So to do that, use the R package call R. So if, if you're in your R session, you run workflow build, nothing that's currently, no package that are loaded or variables you have defined can affect any of the, the analyses that are gonna be run. Because what it does is each file gets run its own extra, uh, its own isolated R process. And let's say you uh, didn't use workflow build and built the file yourself, then the, the reproducibility check will give you a red X, and if you click on it, it'll tell you the exact things that were defined in your global environment. So um, if you had something in your, uh, defined in your, your document, uh, in your analysis, that could have been affecting it. And that stuff's really dangerous because it's really irreproducible, because if I take that file if you run that on your computer with those things to find, and I run it on my computer, I can't recreate what was in your R session at the time. Okay, so like I said, it's really important not just to do the source code, but also the results uh, for when you're doing an exploratory data analysis project. So that is the function workflow publish, which I think is basically the most important uh, workflow R function. So it performs three steps. So it'll commit all your sor the source R markdown file then it forces a rebuild of the HTML, so it knows um, which version of the, of, the, of the R Markdown file created it. Then it'll commit all the, the output, the HTML and the figure files. And it does all this using the R package get to R, runs all the git commands for you. Okay, so the importance of this is a little subtle because you could technically do these three steps yourself, um, but it's really easy to make mistakes, especially when you're in a rush um, or you get distracted. For example, if you were to build the HTML, then edit the R markdown, and then commit everything all at once, you'd never be able to get back to that state of the R markdown that created the HTML. So this forces it so that you will never ha run into that situation. So it's always gonna commit the R markdown first, build the HTML, and then commit the HTML. And if you don't follow that, then of course you'll get a red X, it'll tell you, oh hey, you forgot to do this. Um, and I'll suggest you use Workflow Publish so that you don't have to remember to do these three steps yourself. Okay, and so one thing I really want to make it easier to do, so everyone talks about how cool Git is that you earn version control because you can see past results, but actually doing that in practice is a little bit harder. Uh, you have to really know how to use Git at that point before you can start going backwards. Going forward is a little bit more manageable. Um, so I want people to really see the benefits of what you're going to use for Git. Um, so at the top of every file, it has links to all past versions of the R Markdown and the HTML that you can click on and see. And also, after the end of each figure, it'll have all past versions of that figure. If you click on it, it'll take you right to GitHub and you'll see that version. So if you had given a presentation six months ago and you wanted to see the exact version of that figure, you don't have to remember, oh, is it Git checkout and search your history to figure out when the date was. You can go here and just and interactively. Um, and also then, you don't have to actually be somebody who's working on this project. Anyone who sees your website without having to even download it can see your results from six months ago. So it really highlights the usefulness, usefulness uh, of Git and version control. Okay, so to facilitate collaboration, um, so Workflow R provides wrappers to the most of the main uh, Git uh, functions. And so this allows people to start sharing their code on GitHub or, or other sites. And what nice thing about this is Git to R, using Git to R, you don't have to have Git installed. So if you're hesitant about trying Git, or you just want to be able to uh, try it out, try out Workflow R, there's not a big, bunch of big installation steps beforehand. You can start using it, and then you only have to install Git once you want to start doing more complicated things at the command line. Okay. Um, and then distributing results for sharing, like I said, um, we provide documentation uh, to set it up for GitHub pages. It only takes a few clicks, uh, which is way easier than setting up your own web server. But you don't actually have to use this method. Um, the Workflow or website, that's a self-contained website. So you can copy that docs directory to any sort of server you have access to. So if your institution provides one, um, like an internal server, you could copy and paste it there and it'll work just fine. There's nothing, it's not actually tied to GitHub, it's just that's the easiest way to provide documentation for the average user. And here's a screencast of how easy it is. It's literally three clicks. Uh, you go to settings, and you say serve from that docs, uh, the docs folder.
Okay, so here's an example of a, a workflow or a website created by uh, uh, my colleague Peter Carbonetto. So it's a it's analysis of Divi Data, the bike sharing program in Chicago. And so you can see all his code is right next to his plots. He has a session information stage at the end. At the top, it has this reproducibility report, links to past versions, um, and there's links to all these different uh, various analyses. Okay, so there's multiple different use cases for workflow R. Um, the most common one is sort of a lab notebook for a single researcher. So this example from Lay Sun, a PhD student uh, uh, with my advisor, Matthew Stevens. And so he does a good job of having hyperlinks to all the different analyses and things he's tried and thinking, having his thoughts um, sort of recorded as he meets with, uh, with his advisor, uh, recording their discussions and things he's tried, um, truly using it as a computational lab notebook. Another, uh, the way, main way I use it and I've designed to make it work is with, for collaborative research. So again, with our, that's my, my initial um, motivation for doing this. So this collaboration with uh, uh, Po Yan Tung, Abhishek Sarkar, and, and Joyce Hissel at the University of Chicago. So we're, met, we're, uh, we're again, single cell data. We're trying to connect genetic variation to cell to cell variation in gene expression. And using this way, we can see what each other are doing. Um, and also provide like the latest data because as we collect more data, I can push it and just send it. They can just check the URL and see the latest results. Um, and then another last good uh, uh, option. So Shang Zhu is a former PhD student with Matthew Stevens. Now he's a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford, but he uses it for his course websites and for statistics. So this way he's able to give his students uh, reproducible, organized uh, lecture notes that they can go to and access whenever they need. Um, now, workflow where I've definitely uh, I've tried to make it very useful for exploratory data analysis. So that might not be what you're trying to do. So, if for example you were trying to write a book, you'd probably want to use Bookdown, a blog, Blogdown. Um, there is usefulness in trying to choose the the task you're at. And so, definitely, I've designed this for exploratory data analysis when you may not know the answer to your question uh, that you're researching. Okay. And what workflow R doesn't do for you? So I'm trying to not make it a monolith. I'm trying to focus on what it does well, combining R Markdown with uh, Git for version control. So it doesn't manage any of your software dependencies. So if, for example, if you use Conda or Docker Singularity, you can combine this with workflow R. So um, workflow R tries to be very flexible. So if you like different technologies, you can use it with it. Um, it just needs that analysis in, in docs directory. Um, in practice, I tend to use Conda uh, to combine, to manage software dependencies for my projects. In complex pipelines, it's definitely not a pipeline software. If you have hundreds of, uh, of files and you want to process them all in the same way, you're going to want to use a dedicated uh, pipeline software like Drake or Snakemake. And also a big question I have, so a lot of researchers have sensitive data, like health data on individuals, and so they want to make it some sort of like private or password protected site, but that's a lot more complicated than just free static web hosting. So uh, if you, if you want to be able to do that, you're going to have to talk to your local institution about uh, setting something up. Uh, I can't just provide directions uh, for how to do that easily. <coughs> okay, so installation. Like I said, I've tried to make it uh, an easier installation. So you have to have R, uh, and I recommended you, you having R Studio. It's a way to get Pandoc. Then you install Workflow R from CRAN. And if you don't have an account on GitHub yet, you create an account. And then I have a dedicated uh, website that's created with package down, has lots of documentation on how to get started, and then also how to further customize your site. You can change the theme, uh, you can change the seed that gets set before every analysis. Uh, most, things, uh, that, most things can be customized. Okay, so now we'll see how well the internet does here. Okay. So, Start a new project. Oh no, I was gonna start. I'm gonna start with um, the from the uh, from the IDE just because that'll open up the project for me. So live demo. Okay, so that's gonna open up the project. Um, So I have everything right here, my analysis directory. This is a configuration file I haven't talked much about. Um, but you can see we have all our markdown files in here. 
Here it automatically opens up some of the files that are most likely you're going to want to edit. So if we run workflow build, it's going to go through and all the existing files that come with it, it's going to build. And it's automatically going to open up your website right in the RStudio viewer. So you can see, uh, and click around, and it gives you advice on, for example, it gives you links to like have a license for your code and that sort of thing. So it's trying to encourage best practices. Okay, so once you're, let's say you do some editing and once you're happy with it, what we're going to do is publish it, and that's where we bring in all the Git. So that's going to, remember, do the three steps. It's going to com commit to our markdown files, which we haven't really made any changes. Maybe we should change it real quick. Uh, let's make a change. The live demo. Form tab. Okay. So we're going to publish, and all the all the workflow or commands take uh, they'll take globs. So just like you're used to, if you're used to the in the terminal, uh, be able to give a glob character to select multiple files. Um, workflow or commands understand that uh, natively. Okay, so it's committed everything and reran it. Uh, so here you see my latest code. It's my session information. Okay, so now we have it on our local computer, um, but we want to get it on GitHub. So we go to GitHub, new repository, demo. Okay, so now I create a new repository. So now I have to push it there. And there I'm just going to use the wrapper to git push. Oh, I have to do workflow. Sorry. Got ahead of myself. Okay, so I have to set up a remote. So you only have to do this once. So I'm going to call it origin by convention. Give it your GitHub username. You give it the name of the repo you just created. <coughs> That's live demo. Okay, so now we have a remote repository set up. We can run workflow git push. It's going to ask for your username and your password in a secure fashion. And of course, I got an error. Oh, okay. They put their Wi-Fi probably blocks. Uh, might block it. Well, that's disappointing. Um, actually, let's let's see if it's. See if I can escape and um, do it from the shell. Okay, so the 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 get this doesn't guarantee to work the push because I have to use a bunch of different technologies. I worked at home before I came here, but it's a little finicky. Okay, back. Okay, so now all our code is here. So like I said, we just have to click a few buttons to have a, a web server. Get up pages, the docs branch, save. Okay, so then our site is live at this demo. Here it is. Okay, this is where we see all the information, so Query our session information. You can click these to see everything. Um, these are going to be the same numbers. All right. Okay. So that's the basic idea. You can get started. Uh, you can recreate everything I had done uh, for that PhD project uh, in a few minutes. And what I basically did was sort of what I did was the um, the getting started vignette. So if you download Workflow R and look at the vignettes. Or, or find it through CRAN, um, that'll, that'll be what you'll be able to create. Okay, so in summary, using Workflow R enables you to start working reproducibly immediately. You don't have to go take a course on Git first um, or, or spend a lot of time on that. You can start writing your R code and then as you are um, 
working, you can learn about things like maybe you didn't know about setting a seed. I, for, I certainly didn't know about that when I started grad school. Um, it allows you to focus on your code and not all this infrastructure. It tries to save you from making small, small mistakes. You may want to always uh, commit your files first. You may always want to set a seed, but it's really easy to forget, especially when you're in a rush. And crucially, um, shares your results online. Um, they're able to get your, get your work out there uh, with, the, with other people. So with that, uh, thank you for listening. I want to thank my co-authors, Peter Carbonetto and Matthew Stevens, early adopters for testing and feedback. Uh, we get our funding from the Moore Foundation. And then just to reiterate, yeah, Workflow R, if you want an organized, reproducible, shareable website, um, try Workflow R out. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks for listening. Thanks for a great talk and tool. Yeah. I can't help but wonder what type of uh, genetic work you, you work with with that. Oh, what do I do? Okay. Um, so, let's see. So our main project, right? Let's see what fun I want to talk about. So a good one, that, that, good for a general audience. So we do functional genomics. So we collect information on every single gene in the, in the cells, like what levels they're at and try and predict there's the sort of phenotype or the, the, the state of the cells. So for example, for one of my projects, we collected immune cells from people who had gotten tuberculosis and, and recovered, so we knew they were susceptible. And then we got people who we knew were resistant. They had been infected with the mycobacterium tuberculosis, but had not, gotten to, not, had not progressed to the disease, so they were resistant. And we were able to build a classifier by using like the 15,000 genes expressed in these immune cells to try and predict, um, since we knew the answers, who would be susceptible versus not. And so the idea is to try, it was a proof of concept uh, to build a classifier for tuberculosis susceptibility. Um, so that's sort of the type of data sets I get. A lot of big rectangular matrices of, of ex measurements of lots of sort of cellular features um, and then try and predict things about uh, the cellular state. Wow, thanks. Uh, what type of statistical tools did you use to, to do that? Um, so the main one, uh, so there's a R package, it's a bioconductor package, if you're familiar with that, called Lima. And so it's extending linear models. It uses an empirical Bayes framework to share. A lot of these genomics experiments have very small sample sizes, say three to five. Um, and so the estimates are really noisy, but they're all intercorrelated. All these uh, gene expression is not an isolated, it's all a big network. And so it uses empirical Bayes methods um, to share information across the genes. Um, it's all a very nice framework. If you, if you ever find yourself using this sort of data, yeah, LIMMA, L-I-M-M-A. Um, thanks. Thanks for the questions. Any okay. questions? I've got plenty yeah. of questions. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's been a lot of hype about so-called AI in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, deep learning, uh, natural language processing. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, my genetics work? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's definitely people who are trying to do that thing. So for my tuberculosis one, I did very standard stuff. I was just doing like support vector machines and that sort of thing. But yes, there are a lot of statisticians and computer scientists that are uh, applying um, their techniques to, to genetics especially. Um, so yes, it's definitely making a big impact. It seems, is it, is it um, super tied to, to GitHub? The push, for example, could you use it with like Atlassian Skit? Oh, yeah, the bit bucket. Um, bit bucket, yeah. Yeah, if someone asked me for it, I would be willing to do it. Uh, I haven't had that request it looks yet. It's a little tied to GitHub, right? right? That part is yes. Yeah. But it's you could you can imagine that's easy to refactor yeah. and just change it's like the change the, the yeah the, the prefix right yeah of the, where the, the pop yeah a lot of the stuff like for example when it, being able to see all the past versions so that uses so it's tied to GitHub because there's so many people use it right so there's a yeah. there's a service yeah, called a lot of people use too, though, yeah but so. For example, um, there's a service called Raw Git. That's how I'm able to see the. Pa if you go on GitHub, just their regular uh, GitHub site, and click on an HTML file, it shows you the raw HTML, which isn't very useful. Yes. So there's a certain. Well, there's multiple services. I'm using Raw Git, where by giving a specific URL, it's going to show the displayed code. And so that I do that all under the hood, so that when you click that, you don't have to think about that. You just see, wow, here's this analysis from six months ago, and I'm just seeing it in my browser, or anyone can see it, you know, anywhere. Um, so there's a lot of infrastructure. So you're that, using a third-party internet service to show that. 
Right, yeah. But you could do that. You could just download that and use ours integrated web browser to show it, right? A web server to show it, right? The help web server. I, that's true. If I didn't want, well, if, if we're that's what we're for working locally. If you want, if you want, say, your collaborator who's not savvy enough to download a Git repository to be able to see past results, you can't rely on them to download it. Because so yeah, once you from, if they're using R though, you could do it. Right, exactly. If someone who's using R, it's fine. But I'm trying to solve the problem where oh, for someone who's doesn't, just doesn't yeah. website. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm trying to just cut out the whole emailing a PDF or a HTML yeah. file, which is really ruins what a lot of this is great about. You can click around and yeah. and see everything. Um, just sending one HTML time at a time or 10 HTMLs in each email is really inefficient. I see. Yeah. And it just occurred to me, and you mentioned this last week or a couple weeks ago, I think you can, um, you know, this is again specific to GitHub though, but in the old days, they, they GitHub has recently, like in the last six months, changed the way pages work. But previous to that, I was able, I used to set up GitHub pages uh, programmatically from the command line. Without, without actually inter going to their website at all. Mm -hmm. So it, that probably still can be done, and then you can automate the way that people having to go to GitHub and press, so I'm gonna set up my pages directory here and so forth. That, I think that could be automated. I'll, I'll look into that. You can look into it. So the problem is that they've made it more complicated. It, it used to be able to be automated. Now I'm not sure with the new setup. How you right, because they've added more features. It's harder, because before that you just had to have a separate branch. And That's right, it's just a branch called GH data right. pages. Right, and that's actually what I used in my initial setup, but that having multiple branches, especially for people who are new to Git, is really confusing. So that's why for Workflow R, there's just one branch, and we just cut out that confusion. Oh, it doesn't support multiple branches? Not, not any of these functions. I mean, you could go to the terminal and mess around with things, and but it's not aware of branches. Um, because as someone who works with a lot of people who are maybe reluctantly using Git, yeah. branches are a are, uh, big source of confusion. Okay. But it would be nice to automate away that. The that part of it for the well, <coughs> the problem is that with automating. So let's say like I, I went an automatic. I manually created the repo. Like I could do that programmatically, but you have to have a token. So by the time you explain someone who's a novice that they need to download the secret token and put it in their Bash RC file and don't show it to anybody, and they put it on their HPC where anyone can see their files, and so that's there's security issues, right? So it's easier there's for me SSO to. So that you can use with Git, right? You could use. There, you don't need a token. I think to t I think to op create a repository, like you can query information without no, a no, token. You can, you can, you can, get, get supports. You can use get has an open off OAuth. You can use o open OAuth, right, for, to log authenticate with Git. Program, you know, from R. Without a token, everything I see uses it. Like G like Gabor's package GH uses a token. Okay. Um, okay. And certainly, I could provide documentation for that. But at that point. Yeah. Telling a new person to get in GitHub, click a few things and create a repo is easier than explaining yeah. them OAuth and, and tokens and why you need to keep those private because exposing your token is not. Yeah, no, I mean, there should, I'm sorry, when I mean OAuth, I mean, there should be a way to have a browser pop up, enter your credentials, and then it's. You know, oh, OAuth I see. And, you see what I'm saying? That's what I, I mean see. when I say OAuth, right? You can use a single sign on. I right? see, and yeah. Then, and then you're, then you're in. Okay, that's something worth the, the right. explore. Yeah, have it I mean, pop I think up. That's possible, right? Um, but yeah. again, it would be kind of GitHub specific. Right. right. Um, the British NIH announced they're doing some type of open sourcing of a huge genetic database in a couple of years. You may have heard of that. Do you see that as encouraging a lot more uh, statistical studies on? Um, I mean, it's going to be a great resource. I don't know. I mean, I come from, so the human genetics field has already had a lot of, we've been collecting big, bigger data for science for a while now. So there's already a lot of statisticians and computer scientists. So there's a lot of people interested in that data, but I don't know if it's necessarily changing the direction of the field um, necessarily. Um, people need to scale up their methods to deal with more data, uh, but that, the overall motivation is not changing. Uh, trying to connect the genotype to the phenotype, or you know. <coughs> Do you think that project will have a big impact? You know, just in terms of what can be done. Or? Um, I don't want to be negative. I mean, the problem with things that haven't been found yet. So if you need a bigger, bigger sample size of people to find the effect, that means because the effects are smaller. So 
we'll be able to find some interesting things, but we're not gonna like, there's not like a cure for diabetes in there, right? Like there's low, high effect size genetic variants have been found with smaller studies already. Um, but it'll teach us more about, um, you know, just the genetic arch architecture in general. There's a lot of interesting evolutionary biology questions, a lot of, gives you the context for, what a lot of those big studies do is give you the context that when you get a medical result, you can have the context to interpret it. Like if you, in the clinic, you see someone with a certain genetic variant, having that background data to know how rare it is, is useful. It provides the context. I would, I would hope, yeah. I mean, it's different because it's a consortium, right? So, like, consortium collecting and giving away data is people get it when they have to spend their own money to get it are a little more protective. Uh, some people, not everyone, but um, so I don't know if it's. Yeah, that sounds frustrating. But yes, maybe as more and more, you know, for example, city governments have success, you know, releasing open data and people developing apps around it to make the city more livable or finding out things, maybe that will encourage other cities that this is worth putting the resource, because curating a lot of data is not necessarily trivial. Um, so. It uncovers a lot of problems. Though, yeah. So. Yeah. Are you aware of the database? Thing? Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, if not, it's yes. certainly worthwhile for folks interested in that. Yeah. Speaking of data, this it, it, this kind of only works for kind of very small things, right? You can't have your data directory and have uh, hundreds of gigabytes in there. You've got a really limited um, total for the free GitHub account. Like your pre storage space is pretty small, right? Like uh, a couple gigabytes, you know. And, and then you're, I think, in fact, it's even more draconian. They limit the size of individual files with hard caps. Right. It's 100 megabytes per file. Yeah. So yeah. So there's two things to that. One is by the time I usually get to R, it's when I'm exploring, and the data set's usually much smaller. So I'm, you know, I start off with, you know, 100 gigabytes worth of data, but then I process that down to something that I'm going to read into R, and that thing is usually version controllable. And when it's not, so, so this recent project, I've created too much data. So GitHub supports Git LFS, large file storage, and for something like 60 bucks a year or something, I get like 50 gigabytes, which I'm not even close to mm -hmm. getting to, um, and that makes it. Not only is you can store it on GitHub so people can get it, but it also doesn't bog down your, your Git repo because it's just saving hash strings of the data. But yeah, definitely a limitation. Would you like to entertain a couple others somewhat? That question? <laughs> well, yeah, I think we're still somewhat in time. I, I went pretty fast, so. Well, it depends for who. So, like for cancer researchers, yes, because because cancer involves new mutations a lot. So there's there's a difference between something that, a genetic variant that predisposes you to getting cancer, and also a genetic variant that arises in the cancer cell because sort of DNA repair mechanisms get disabled and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of studies that are focused more on cancer genetics, where they take a healthy tissue from the individual and then they take a cancerous cancerous sort of paired. They can they do that for a bunch of different individuals, say with like colon cancer, and then you keep doing a paired analysis, and then you can sort of see the mutations that are driving the cancer. Um, but that's, yeah, but that's actually a different question than like susceptibility to cancer. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of value, and there's lots of studies that do exactly that, trying to understand the mutations that are, what makes a cancer sort of metastasize and start spreading uh, throughout the body. And, and that might tell us about future aspects of susceptibility 
Yeah, I mean, one thing they definitely want to find are drug targets. So if you find that a certain gene or pathway is constantly be the one that's getting mutated uh, before the cancer starts, you know, going out of control, those are great targets. If you can shut that down, you just make sure that doesn't happen. Right? Those those enzymes don't get disabled. Um, so that's a big motivation for it. I think I have to come talk about my genetics work sometime. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right, thanks for having me.